Well, welcome. We are so happy that you've come and we are excited to share our expedition with you. Uh, we took our trip at the end of September, excuse me, the end of August, beginning of September last year. Um, we were about three weeks, um, trip was about three weeks long. And to just kind of put some proportion to it, my RV is about two years old now. And last year, prior to our trip, we had done three short trips <laughs> with setups and takedowns. So... <laughs> Uh-oh, it's not moving. Hang on. A little technical difficulty here. There it goes. What'd you do? Okay. Um, okay, we have a map, an overview of our routes. We decided to take uh, the North Dakota going out and South Dakota coming back. Each camper uh, indicates where we stayed. And we stayed either one night two nights or five nights. Places where we stayed multiple nights, we also rented a car. Planning, <laughs> since this was kind of an epic trip for us, um, we did a lot of planning, spent a lot of hours. Judy did all kinds of work. We decided what kinds of things we wanted to see on our way and of what we wanted to do in Glacier when we got there. Um, she determined kind of where our stops would be and I found uh, um, campgrounds that would fit our needs, hopefully things that would <laughs> make it very simple to set up. Um, we had all the campgrounds reserved. We had rental cars reserved. We had a couple of entertainment things already reserved. We, you know, the, the normal things that go on clothes and, what you know, things are going to take. Getting the RV ready, make sure it's, you know, going to make it. And we decided we would go to Canada one day. So we um, had to make sure we had our passports and, uh, you know, everything legal for the car, for the, for the, um, well, for the car and my dog. So he had to have special papers to, you know, to get in and out of Canada. Anxieties? Yeah. <laughs> Can we do this? <laughs> okay. Our first night was in Minneapolis. And uh, as a result of this stay, we decided that we needed to log lessons learned. So we had several here. First lesson is the um, outside um, little water um, hose. The knobs turn off to the inside, not righty tighty lefty loosey. The next thing we learned was that when you're setting up the sewer line, you need to make sure you take the little stoppers out of either end of the tubing prior, <laughs> prior to hooking it up to the RV and using it. Big lesson. <laughs> and then um, we also decided that we should have brought a bigger pair of pliers. <laughs> okay. The second day of driving, again, was an all driving day. We needed to get to Bismarck, North Dakota. It was all interstate driving. Uh, but as you get further west, the gas stations sometimes get further apart. So we were trying to remain cognizant of what gas gauge said and what our you know, personal needs might be because we didn't want to make too many stops. The sign kept saying Dawson fuel, Dawson fuel, Dawson fuel for miles and miles pulled off at Dawson and oh my goodness this is the gas station it had one the gas station one pump and um nobody was around so luckily it worked but uh we learned that Dawson is only 214 acres big and a population of 74. <laughs> So uh, the, the the next thing is an uh, looks like an old mid century gas station, and it's actually um, a, a a travel stop, a rest stop, and we th thought that was kind of interesting. So we wanted to break up the trip a little bit, so we weren't driving every day, just you know, for hours on end. And one of our first stops was. Um, the next day, uh, just outside of Bismarck, to one of the many Lewis and Clark interpretive centers um, along the Lewis and Clark Trail and the Missouri River. 
it's a it's really a nice, lovely little stop because it was a, a small museum, but you know, superbly done, where we could learn about the Lakota Sioux and the Hadassah people, uh, about the French fur traders in the area, and of course about the Lewis and Clark um, expedition as they stayed in the area. Outside, they had this great statue, one of um, the Mandan chief, uh, Shaheki, and Lewis and Clark. A short way, uh, short ways um, from there is a um, a full size replica of Fort Mandan, where Lewis and Clark stayed over the winter with um, their thirty three men. This is where they met um, Charbonneau, who was the interpreter between the um, the French, the English, and the Native Americans, and Sacagawea, who was Charbonneau's wife, who did accompany them a short uh, while on the trip. Now, if you're looking for something a little bit different um, as you're driving along, a little diversion, um, I would suggest the Enchanted Highway. It extends from Gladstone, North Dakota, for about 32 miles south, and along it are seven giant size scrap metal sculptures. The one you see on the right with the birds, birds flying, is the largest scrap metal sculpture in the entire world. <laughs> but a couple of the others out of the other six, these are a couple of my favorite. Um, the world's largest Tin Man family, and a 60-foot grasshopper. Our stop uh, is here in Medora. You can see the pink dot in the bottom. And our plan for Medora was to see Theodore Roosevelt National Park, the Badlands. In researching this trip, Judy stumbled onto the fact that there is more than one area in the United States with Badlands small b. Um, we did the north unit, then we moved to the south unit. We did not get to the the, the site of uh, Theodore Roosevelt's cabin. This is a shot of Boots Campground. Uh, if <laughs> you've been by any kind of normal campground, you see that it's very primitive, um, certainly not what you expect. And it was totally unmanned. Nobody was there to, to answer questions. It did have a redeeming quality, and that is at night it was dark, and we could sit outside of our RV, and oh my goodness, I haven't seen uh, skies with um, Milky Way and shooting stars, I don't know, since for 50 years or so. It was awesome. We took off the next morning, and I had to include this because it was so interesting as we traveled to see acres and acres of um, sunflowers and these are getting toward ready to to harvest i would guess and they have fields of sunflowers like we have fields of corn so i was one thing that i really enjoy as they travel is looking at all the geology and just imagining all the millions of years that it took to create these formations um, we started our day in the northern unit and where we saw some you know uh, this type of, of landscape Badlands means just that. The land isn't good for agriculture. It's not good for grazing. It has, um, the water is bad. It's not pretty unusable. And you can't travel across it. So both the French and the Lakota Sioux had words in their languages for badlands. Um, but when I look at it, I'm thinking about the millions of years it took to create this. And so this is a result of deposition and erosion. This area had been an inland sea. And so sediments had been flowing into this area from um, all the surrounding area for um, hundreds of thousands of years until the sea um, eventually evaporated. The land was uplifted a little bit. Along came the ice age and glaciation. And now you had a lot of running water as those uh, glaciers melted from the ice age and it carved out or eroded on what we see today. So you see lots of layers of sedimentary rock the different colors really just reflect some of the different minerals um, that were in the rock as the layers were laid down. This one was sort of an interesting one to me. The gray layer that you see at the top is 50 feet deep. It's bentonite clay and bentonite clay comes from volcanic ash. So all I can imagine, first of all, think about 50 feet deep of it, the amount of volcanic ash that had to be in the air. Um, and then thinking about just the eruption of the volcanoes along the West Coast that had to been going on at that time in history for this amount of ash to be deposited here. 
Bentonite clay is in very stable and it actually kind of flows and you can kind of see that in this picture. But what was also interesting, we saw these big lumpy like dumbbells and big balls. They're, um, they look like cannonballs, the size of cannonballs um, or a bowling ball. And in fact, they're called cannonball concretions. Geologists aren't quite sure how they're formed. They think it's sort of like a pearl where uh, you get a mineral and other minerals just keep accumulating around it. Um, the reddish color on there would indicate that um, the element was iron and hematite was the mineral that was being formed there. And then it was just buried in the sediment only to be exposed by erosion. Another one of my favorite features, probably because of the name, are hoodoos. Hoodoos look like little mushrooms and they're formed in areas that you have the sedimentary rock, different hardnesses of sedimentary rocks. So when you get water or wind erosion, they erode out differently and they just look like little mushrooms. And finally, another um, feature in the North Unit brings us back to the Missouri River. You see the Missouri River flowing, actually meandering through a really flat part of the valley in the, it's not quite the middle, but part in part of the Badlands. And they're surrounded by cottonwood trees. And we had a lovely lunch in the picnic area in the cottonwood trees. Um, next, we went to the Southern Unit. We wanted to take it in. It wasn't quite as eroded as the Northern Unit. We didn't see any hoodoos here or um, the concretions. The hills were a little bit more rounded and they were a little bit more colorful. So it was named the Painted Canyon. South Unit provided us with animals. And this is a prairie dog town and you can see that all these little uh, lumps and, and dark spots, those are the, the entrances and exits for these. And then of course, in the inset, you can see the little dog himself. Bison, one of my favorite things. And this guy was massive. Uh, this was an area, there was a couple of dozen head maybe, and it was kind of like after lunch. So I think they were all getting ready for naps. This is Medora. And this is one of the features, one of the tourist things for, about Medora. And it's a little theater and it takes good use of um, the terrain. And uh, uh, it was a delightful musical and um, a really nice ending to a day. Our next um, area was uh, near Billings, Montana. Um, and we decided to, we wanted to hit Little Bighorn. So we spent most of our time in this general area. And then, um, where, where the base, the majority of the fighting took place. And this is the little area that kind of ended it all. And um, this was later in the day and, you know, the final uh, killing of, of all of the military. And the only thing that was left of the military was one horse that survived. So the monument uh, that was originally put up is um, only to the soldiers. And what you see in front of you in the fence is the area in which Custer actually died. You can see the white monuments, um, um, and those were for where various soldiers um, were killed. This is uh, a Native American uh, designed monument, and it wasn't put up until the 1990s. And um, it was to honor all the Native Americans who also happened to some, many of them um, have their last stand there. At this point in time too, the uh, Park Service started putting up red uh, headstones at the spots where the Native Americans were killed. This is just a, a quick video to show you how massive this area is. I was just so, Anyway, and this was where uh, Custer was way out there to start and sent people in to do reconnaissance. The Native Americans were down in this area. This is where they were living in, in a lot of the time and they knew the area. And there was a great uh, um, mix up on how many uh, Native Americans there were. This is called a, um, sure, what is it called? A prayer tree. <laughs> a prayer tree. Oh my gosh. Yes, this is called a prayer tree. And Native Americans um, put the little colorful pieces of fabric on this tree and tie it with uh, prayers and good wishes. 
Well, we stayed two nights in Billings, Montana, in a campground that was on the Yellowstone River. This is the same river that flows through Yellowstone National Park. Um, it was it was really nice, a nice place to kind of hang out for a couple evenings. The walks in the evenings took us across a dry creek bed, which I'm sure is filled with water in springtime, um, through the cottonwood trees and over to the edge of the Yellowstone River. We learned a couple more lessons here about our RV. One is Linda and I put little wedge blocks under the tires, and that's to prevent um, any rolling of the RV um, during the night. What we didn't think about was talking about the direction we <laughs> faced the little wedge blocks. And we found in the morning when we were ready to leave um, that we had wedged them in and you can't just pull them out and they were facing different directions. So unfortunately we sacrificed one of our little <laughs> wedge blocks in order to be able to pull out in a certain direction. Also, you see that there are trees here, the cottonwood trees, which we thought were really nice. And so we were gonna put out the awning one evening. And again, thinking about, you have to realize the height of the trees the length of the awning um, before you start pulling things like that out. Well, we were back at the Missouri River. We had a long day ahead of us between Billings because we were going to make it all the way to East Glacier National Park. We had to stop in Hel Helena on the way to pick up a car. So we had hours of driving ahead of us, but we did run into the Missouri River again. Um, the headwaters where Lewis and Clark um, also were. And there are three rivers um, that come together that form the Missouri River. Lewis and Clark named them Jefferson, Madison, and Gallatin after the president, vice president, and secretary of the treasury at the time. Um, there were people here who were going rafting down the river. It was a very hot day. Linda and I had to settle for having a nice lunch in the shade. Um, it was a big sky Montana. And I now know why that term is there. And um, it, we drove for probably six to seven hours that day. Um, to, we came to our um, campground in the evening, Chewing Black Bones. Chewing Black Bones campground is on a Native American um, tribal lands. And we thought, you know, Linda did a great job all along the way in making sure we had full hookups and that the ground was going to be flat because we weren't all that sure. When she said we might be anxious about things, one of the things we we're anxious about is if we had the level, the RV. It had automatic levelers. Um, but we got to this campground and it did not want to level. It looked pretty flat to us, but it was not a happy camper. So we had to pull out the Lego blocks, as we call them, in order to you, know, you have to kind of play around with them a little bit to make sure that you can get your RV leveled in order to be parked for the night. Um, as I said, we have been passing through a lot of smoky air during our entire day. You could actually smell the smoke in the air. And you might recall last summer the amount of fires that were um, being reported in the news in Washington, Oregon, and Western Montana. So this was our, our sunset in uh, East Glacier. Well, since this was our destination, our final goal was Glacier National Park. We wanted to take a little time to orient you to the park itself. If you look real closely, there is um, almost a straight line, uh, more near the top, um, which is um, the border between Canada and the United States. And you can see that the mountain system that's part of Glacier National Park actually is in the United States as well as in Canada. The brown lines are roads. There is only There are only two ways to get from the east side to the west side of Glacier National Park. One is on the road that you see going through them, somewhat the middle, and that's going to the Sun Road um, that can take you from uh, St. Mary uh, or the East Glacier entrance all the way over to the West Glacier entrance. Um, it is a 51 mile road and it takes two hours to go across without any stops. The second way is to actually go around the outside of the park. Um, and again, if you're at the East Glacier entrance and you go all the way around to the West Glacier entrance, it's also about a two hour drive. Um, because we could not take the RV across going to the Sun Road, um, when we did transfer over to the west side, we had to do the long drive, or it seemed like a long drive around. Um, I wanted to just let you know, it kind of orient you a little bit. There's um, two major lakes that we're going to talk about. One is St. Mary Lake on the east side and McDonald Lake on the west side. So when we were talking about how to organize, talking about Glacier National Park, we decided to focus on the things we did on the east side first and then on the west side. 
The east side is the less popular um, side of Glacier National Park. It's not as crowded, it, or it doesn't seem as crowded. Um, you have the east entrance, and you can go on going to the Sun Road. There's a tour on St. Mary Lake. If you go a little bit to the north, there's a region called Many Glacier. And if you go to the south, there's an area that's called Two Medicine. So we want to focus on the east side first. Well, you have to get tickets. Unlike most national parks, you have to get tickets to go into Glacier National Park ahead of time. You get them online. Um, by the time we were actually organizing our trip, which, which was in March, um, we were too late to get tickets, three-day passes online. So another way to get into the park is to arrange to have some tours. Um, one of the tours we decided to take were the Red Bus Tours. These are called the Rubies of the Rockies. Um, the fleet of 33 different um, jammers um, are from the 1930s and been totally refurbished and um, th they're just kind of fun to drive in. You can see that each row has its own door to get into the row on the bus and the roof retracts so that you get this big panoramic view as you're driving along. There's many different tours of the red bus tours. Um, we took the one that went from St. Mary to Logan Pass um, on the east side of Glacier National Park. And we really recommend that even if you um, do have your three-day pass, you still might want to take one of these tours. Um, we saw a lot of different landscapes as we're coming across this. Heavy Runner Mountain is a good example of how the mountains were formed. Um, and Because mountains get formed in different ways. These are actually mountains formed from sedimentation, from sedimentary, sedimentary rock. If you look closely, you can see a lot of different layers in this rock. So one and a half billion years ago, <laughs> um, th there were sediments in this interior sea that were being started to be laying down. And you can see the depth, um, heavy runner rock is about 8,000 feet high um, in elevation, maybe the um, from top to bottom, what you see here, maybe five, 600 feet. Um, so as that sediment um, was laid down, it gets heavy and it can, you know, can, compresses on itself and you also get metamorphic rock um, in the area. So you have sedimentary and metamorphic rock that are forming um, Glacier National Mountains. Um, about 150 million years ago, the uh, Pacific Ocean plates started to crash into the North American plate, actually going under the North American plate. And that's where the uplift came. So this was a sea that then became uplifted. And the mountains in Glacier National Park are between 8,000 and 10,000 feet high. So that was quite a bit of uplift, if you think about it. Climate changed. We had the ice ages. And during the ice ages, this whole area was covered with glaciers. Um, and was carving out as it as those glaciers moved, they'd carve out the softer rock. Um, and eventually, the ice ages pretty much ended. We're you know we still have some glacial ice um, in the world, um, but you know so then we had um, the rocks were being exposed. We saw a lot of waterfalls that we were there. Haystack Falls actually um, is about five hundred feet. It falls about five hundred feet. This is one of our smoky days. Um, Clement Mountain is pretty prominent from a lot of different views with the glacier underneath. Um, I, again, you can kind of see, you know, the, the layers of sediment, but uh, the glaciers in Glacier National Park, I remember Linda saying, oh, I want to go to Glacier National Park because I want to see the glaciers. And I said, um, you may be in for a surprise <laughs> because not so many glaciers there anymore. In 1850, at the end of the Little Ice Age, there are 150 named glaciers in Glacier National Park. Today, there are 25 active glaciers in Glacier National Park. And you might say, well, what makes an active glacier? Um, three criteria. One is, this is not just snow. This is actually glacial ice. And so snow goes through a process of being compressed into glacier ice. In Glacier National Park, they require glaciers to be at least 25 acres in size. And the third requirement of glaciers anywhere in the world is that they are actually flowing or moving downhill. So um, those are the criteria um, that make a glacier a glacier. Unfortunately, again, um, in the last 50 years, Glacier National Park has lost 80% of um, the glaciers that were there. But glaciers leave lots of great features. We also saw Otokomi Mountain. 
Otokami was a Native American who accompanied George Grinnell, and you're going to hear his name a lot, a lot of features named after him, because he was there as an explorer and, um, you know, kind of taking in what the, the area had to offer and mapping it out. So above Rising Sun Lodge, you see the peak here, is this wonderful example of a cirque, a bowl-shaped part of a mountain. It's carved out by a glacier. So you have a, a great glacial feature that's left. Single Shot Mountain was named because George Grinnell had only a single shot to bring down a giant um, mountain sheep. And Logan Pass is the highest point along going to the Sun Road. Uh, again, we saw a, a nice view of Clement Mountain here and the glacier. This is the trailhead for about five or six different hiking trails that take you inland to other waterfalls, glaciers, and mountain features. Uh, uh, we also, you know, it, it's a beautiful Alpine Valley. We did a, a boat tour on St. Mary. The bigger lakes all offer some kind of boat tours and all the boats are antiques. Ours was the one on the right. And this was the last day for tours uh, on St. Mary Lake. The next day we saw it, our boat in the parking lot um, waiting to be stored. So this is a shot, uh, a couple of shots of St. Mary Lake. And um, the one on the left just shows that the aftermath of some forest fires and that the skeletons of the trees just still remain. On the right uh, is a shot of St. Mary Lake and you can kind of get an idea of the glacial flower that um, is formed by in, in waters uh, as a result of the glaciers moving uh, and scrunching and and milling um, the the materials underneath it with its weight into such fine powder that it uh, just suspends in the lake. And if you, you ever go to Glacier Bay, uh, Alaska, that is very thick, very thick with glacial flour. This is Grinnell Formation. And the, the interesting part of this is the red. The red is, um, as Judy said, it's this whole area was at one point uh, an inland sea. And so this red was formed because it had a, a, um, iron, some iron uh, minerals in it, but it's formed by oxidation and um, as, a, as a result of time going on. And the oxidation brings out the hematite. And it only takes about 3% hematite to form this, this red color. Wild Goose Island. Um, it's just a small island in the middle of the lake. And the legend has it that two Indian tribes lived on opposite sides of the lake uh, with the island in between them. A young couple, one from each tribe, fell in love much to the chagrin of their families. They fled to the island where the great spirit took care of them. Knowing that geese mate for life, the great spirit turned them into geese. So when the families arrived the next day, all they found was a pair of geese um, affectionately rubbing their necks together. This is a shot from uh, St. Mary Lake of going to the sun um, formation and um, or going to the sun mountain. And you can also see how, uh, how, how rough the water was that day. So going to the sun um, also shows where the glacier has rubbed and make this a pretty pointy little area. This is Bering Falls. It's a quick stop that they had had us do and get out and see the falls. Everybody loves falls. But what was very interesting is the, the water uh, in the water below the falls were these beautiful colored rocks. And again, they were formed all from the same kind of rock with iron in them. But some were oxidized and turned red and others were um had you know were pressed and pressed and pressed and they turned green 
This is a shot from the boat of going to the Sun Road. And you can see that there are cars and vehicles up there, but the whole road was planned so that if there were no cars, it wouldn't be uh, so obtrusive. So I think going to the Sun Road is just an amazing feat. Um, Congress uh, uh, planned for the money in 1921. It took 12 years to complete the entire road that's 51 miles long. Um, and it wasn't entirely paved until um, 1952. Um, and kind of twist here it looks pretty straight, but it twists and turns amongst all the different mountains that are there. So in order to build it, men sometimes they had to hike in however many miles it might have been, up to even like 12 miles through the mountainous terrain. They'd be dropped down on ropes and to insert dynamite into the side of the mountain in order to blast out where the road might be. So it, I mean, to to me, this whole thing was really an amazing feat. This is uh called um, Two Medicine area, and it's in the southeast corner. And uh, it's a simple, nice little walk. Um, I'm sure there might there were other trails you could do, but we just walked back to see Running Eagle Falls. And what was interesting about Running Eagle Falls is it did not come over the top of the, um, the rocks, it came through. And so they also nicknamed it Trick Falls. So another place on the east side is an, a region called Many Glacier, which does have many glaciers um, remaining. Uh, the glacier that you see in the background here is Grinnell Glacier. And um, the lake that you see is Sherburn Lake. Sherburn Lake was named after an early uh, settler in the area. Uh, to get into Many Glacier, to the National Park entrance, you do drive through part of the Native American Reservation, and you come to Sherburn Lake first. And I, this is just, again, I'm, I'm just so amazed as I think about glaciation and how it changes the land. Um, look at the top here, U-shaped valley, meaning that that's where a glacier would flow from at one time. It would have flown down this valley into this huge U-shaped valley. Making a huge <laughs> Making the U-shaped valley. And if you think about pine trees being 50 feet tall or so, it's, you know, we're talking about valleys that are carved out that are five, six, 700 feet um, deep. Glaciers retreated. And so now the only thing left in this particular um, photograph is Grinnell Glacier. But um, you can see all these deposit, all these features are being carved out. The other part of glaciation is deposition. So where you see all these trees, the glacier that would have come forward as it started to retreat, it would have dropped all this gravelly stuff called, and formed what's called a moraine or a small hill. And most of the moraines today are, are covered in trees. Well, we were surprised when we were driving along this lake that we saw a dam because when you're in national parks, everything is kept pretty natural. Um, however, I, we came soon to realize that we were still on part of the um, Blackfoot uh, Native American lands. Um, when this dam was built in 1921, it was to help to control some floodwaters. Um, today, it's still there. It's a recreational area because you have the reservoir there, um, but it's also used for irrigation water in north central Mon Montana. So as we were in the Many Glacier region, again, we just saw some beautiful sites um, as we went through. In this particular area, you can see part of the formation of a cirque and almost the formation of a horn, which usually has at least three sides carved out to form like a little pointy peak. At the end of the road, you come to Many Glacier Hotel, which is the largest hotel in the park. Um, it's situated on Swift Current Lake, which is also, again, on the trailhead for many um, trails, hiking trails that go into the ba more backcountry of the area. And again, a very prominent Grinnell Peak stands out. Okay, uh, it's time to leave uh, the east side and travel down and around uh, and end up in um, West Glacier Village. And our uh, campground was just a, a block or so north of that. It was a really nice KOA. But the little village here is not only, uh, you know, the way to get into the entrance of the park, 
but it also provides a place where you can get gas. There's a little diner there, a grocery store, place to get um, uh, like um, souvenirs and things like that. And I believe it, even a place to get kayaks and things if you wanted to, um, you know, head out and do those kind of activities. This is not, not atypical. This is usual for getting into West Glacier. Uh, these, all these people had to have passes. Um, now, anyway, in the Glacier National Park this year, you have to have a pass. And I think that's beginning to happen in a lot of national parks. You have to have a pass. And so if you're planning anything to do with nat uh, national parks, check it out a way, way, way in advance. This is our campsite, uh, nice and level, um, have our own little area, and um, the evening was beautiful. All campgrounds have a place that they, that they want you to walk your dogs. Some of them even have uh, areas that are fenced, and this was a nice big area. So Corky's the littlest dog there, and um, we went and played. Well, we wanted to share with you what we saw on the west side of Glacier National Park. Uh, as I said, we were a little bit concerned about being able to get into the park itself, as well as being on going to the Sun Road. So we arranged for a boat tour of Lake McDonald, and it started at the lodge in the background and um, came down the dock. Uh, lake McDonald is the largest lake at Glacier National Park. It's 10 miles long and 500 feet deep. So it's glacially formed. We're looking here somewhat to like to the Northeast. And again, you can see this beautiful U-shaped valley um, where the glaciers would have advanced coming to carve out not only these valleys, but um, the area that Lake McDonald is in. Mm -hmm. um, at the edge, you see the trees. So this these trees are on a moraine, a small hill that as the glacier retreated, this was a recessional moraine. Um, it dumped some of you know the debris that it had in it. And today, so that glaciers no longer, well, there are no glaciers here at this point to flow through here, but no rivers or anything else were flowing into this. As you look, you know, look at this image, you see certain, you know, a blue sky might not be the clearest of days, but when I turned around to take a view of the other side of the lake, this is that same day, like within seconds. So there was a lot of smoke in the air, especially more to um, the south. And put this view here, you can see how calm the lake is um, on this particular day. But at the other end of the lake, you see the terminal moraine, as far as that glacier went, that closed off this particular part of this glacial valley. Um, this is Apgar Village um, is located on this moraine as well. Um, so it closed off and created Lake McDonald. This uh, hill is straight across pretty much from the boat dock. And you can see how different it looks. Judy's been showing you, you know, the dark groves of, or, you know, acres and acres of trees. This is a result at Howell Ridge of a fire in uh, 2018. And uh, it was started by, you know, natural, just a storm, and it burned um, 3,500 acres over there. And, um, it, you know, it's still just beginning, beginning to come back. So Lake McDonald Lodge is a, a good example of the lodges in um, and hotels that you can find in the park. There are seven of them within the park that you can arrange to stay in. McDonald Lodge was built in 1913. You can see it was built, you know, huge timbers. And when you're in the um, in the lobby area, you can see up all three stories. Outside, it looks a little bit more like a Swiss chalet. As in most national parks, um, the rooms do not have air conditioning. They do not have TVs and they don't have telephones. Um, however, they have been renovated, so you do have a private bath. So as we were driving, we drove back and forth across going to the Sun Road several times during our trip. Um, when we left from West Glacier, um, after you pass Lake McDonald, one of the first pull-offs that you can go to are McDonald Falls. And you can see by the size of the people, um, the falls have 
um, some height here. And they were just, you know, kind of a lovely place to be. This is another spot on Donald Creek, uh, Sacred Dancing Cascade. This particular one not only had a, a turnoff where you can park, but it also had stairs down so you could um, be one with <laughs> one with the, the creek if you so desired. Uh, this is another spot on going to the Sun Road, and this is Mount Jackson. It's the fourth tallest peak in the park at just a little over 10,000 feet. And um, we did find a little spot here to sit and um, have our picnic lunch one day. So just as on the east side, the west side has numerous falls. Bird Woman Falls comes from a hanging valley, and the water that comes in it is only from um, melt from uh, snow melt and from glacier, glaciers that might still be melting. Um, and it's like 10,000, uh, close to, I'm sorry, to close to 1,000 feet high. This is one of my favorite shots. And I just love the way it made a monochromatic, um, um, the way it kept going and got darker or lighter and lighter from the dark. This is uh, just west of the pass. And it shows McDonald Creek. And it, you know, it goes all the way through the west side of the park and has various places where you get close enough to pull your car off and be able to look at it without actually hiking. And do you hear me saying, you shape ballet? <laughs> <laughs> As we drove along, I mean, there are vista after vista, there's some pull offs. Um, but I took a lot of pictures also just from the car window because there, everything was just, just so glorious. And as you know, sometimes the, the magnificence of something isn't captured totally in, in photographs. Um, we couldn't always find the name of the mountains we were looking at. And this one, the, the peak that you see on the left-hand side is Little Matterhorn Mountain, but could not find the name of the one that's in the front. This was uh, going across, you never know what you're going to find when you go across <laughs> going to the Sun Road. Well, there was no sun that day. <laughs> there was snow, though. And, um, you know, it was just surprising. And this is looking at the glacier. And, you know, the day before, all of those little ridges uh, on the rocks above had absolutely no snow. So this happened overnight. And as we kept driving, oh, here's the end. You know it ends somewhere, but we actually saw the end of the cloud. So I've taught about national parks and what you might see in national parks for several years. And going to the Sun Road has just an iconic view um, when you're teaching about Glacier National Park. There are two tunnels in the park. There's one on the east side. This is the west side tunnel. And as you drive through it, it actually has some openings in it that you can look out over McDonald Creek um, Valley and um, Heaven's Peak. So it's a pretty iconic view. Um, just to kind of give you a little idea of what it's like to drive along on the edge. <laughs> there were times I said, Linda, do you want to move over a little bit more? She's like, I can't. And then I'd say to Judy, don't you want <laughs> Okay, we went to Canada. It was a great day. Um, uh, one of the things that the Canadian government wants you to do before you go is to register your uh, plans online. So we knew that we got online, we began the whole process as we got to the question of where are you going to stay? Well, we weren't going to stay. We we're going up and coming back on the same day and it wanted an address and we didn't know uh, it stumped us because we weren't staying anywhere. So we proceeded on without it, um, and the little uh, crossing or border guard didn't really appreciate it. Gave, it. We used up our only one chance of going across without prior plans that were registered. We got there; it was fine, you know. But make sure you make your plans online before you head to Canada. Into Canada. This is uh, the Prince of Wales Hotel in Waterton. It is, um, was built in the 1860s and has 110 rooms and it's built on a hill. So this is a short part. If you were on the other side, you could see this, it, you know, it's even more majestic, but we couldn't get a good shot from that side. 
So Waterton, there are actually two Waterton lakes. Uh, this is Upper Waterton Lake. Two thirds of it are in the United States and one third in Canada. It's part of a UNESCO heritage bio reserve site to protect the grasslands and the native species. Okay, this is Cameron Falls. It's right in the heart of Waterton, uh, right next to a parking lot. So it's all paved, it's easy to see. And we just thought it was so unique because of the way it crisscrosses it, itself. And the, the you know, the rocks that it's flowing across are a billion years old. It just is so incredible to think about that. So the reason that um, I had wanted to go up there is that um, the Waterton, the Canadian um, Waterton National Park, <clears throat> excuse me, is part of the International Peace Park with uh, Glacier National Park in the United States. The two countries form the first International Peace Park um, with Waterton and Glacier in 1932. Well, our time, we didn't have uh, much longer to spend um, at Waterton. We had to get back across the border before the border actually closed. Um, but we saw places like this, um, like little pullouts that had statues um, in tribute to the Blackfoot Nation and several places um, in Montana. The uh, Blackfoot and Blackfeet, Blackfeet is, uh, are the tribes that are in the United States. The Blackfoot Nation actually is in Canada and the United States completely surrounding Glacier National Park. When we needed to leave, we'd spent seven days in Glacier National Park. We left going down through the west entrance and through Kalispell, which is a little bit larger city, um, stocked up on a few more food supplies and headed toward Billings, Montana. Again, we like to break up our um, days a little bit with little stops. So we did stop at Devil's Tower in Wyoming. This is um, the world's largest columnar structure. It's, this is granite that's formed underground and with the erosion around it um, becomes exposed. And as the um, igneous rock is cooling underground, it breaks, it fractures and breaks into these columns. And so these are, most of them are six sided, but they could be five sided or four sided. Like I said, it's the, um, the best example in the entire world. Um, we continued on into South Dakota and decided again to have several stops here. Um, we were near Rapid City and we stopped to see Crazy Horse Monument, um, Custer State Park, um, in Keystone is Mount Rushmore, and then Badlands National Park. Well, Crazy Horse Memorial is um, dedicated to Lakota, uh, Lakota Chief um, Crazy Horse. His cousin had um, thought of this idea as a dedication to him and hired um, Korzak Zokowski, who had also worked on Mount Rushmore, to help build this um, this memorial. It is in granite, which is an igneous rock, so the Black Hills are made of um, granite. The, this structure was started in 1948. This is, a, the picture I, that you see here, it was taken last fall. So it still is in, <laughs> um, still being carved out. They have no date in terms of when they think that it will be finalized. Um, the area also, has a museum that for artifacts of all Native American cultures, a depository for it, and um, tries to show the traditions of Native Americans. So while we were there, we saw the Lakota hoop dancer, which was just amazing. She started with one hoop and ended with 24. And she configured them and stepped through them and danced with them, um, sometimes, you know, forming different um, features, sometimes like a caterpillar or um, a butterfly. So it was pretty amazing to watch her dance. Oops, you gave them away. Oh, okay. <laughs> I did. So another, uh, this is, was one of my favorite days, the Bison Center. Um, and <clears throat> we got to a place where there were cars stopped. And as we pulled up and stopped, bison were just parading both directions across this road. And we took, a, you know, we could have spent an hour just showing you bison pictures, but we whittled it down to this massive, uh, just majestic guy and uh, a mama and a, I don't know, it's not a very small calf. He could probably be eating grass, but it was as if there was a shift change at a factory or something, and they were just going back and forth across the road. It was mesmerizing. And another area is this, um, these are feral 
um, donkeys um, or burros, and they are so docile, unlike a feral cat or something. And as long as you had a food piece, they would stay by your car. If they came and you just petted them and didn't have a, an offering, they were gone. They, they went somewhere else. In the evening, we went to uh, Mount Rushmore. We'd been there in the day, both of us had different trips. And I have to say that this shot would uh, actually be the finale of the evening. There was a, um, a, a ranger talk uh, and at the beginning of his talk, he invited all veterans or a proxy if a veteran wasn't capable of making the stairs to come onto the stage and um, they did. So after his talk about how the decisions were made for what would go into this national park and so on and so forth, uh, they did the ceremony to lower the flag and the veterans um, shared in folding it properly. And of course there was patriotic music. And Judy and I both had significant others that were veterans. So this was like, very emotional and very heartwarming for us. So wall drug, what can I say of wall drug? You see the signs for miles and miles and miles uh, um, offering you free ice water. Well, that's how um, wall drug got started. They were off the main um, road and um, Bill Holstead's wife said, hey, if you offer a free glass of ice water, maybe it'll draw some people towards our drugstore. So here they are um, many years later, um, they get about 2 million visitors um, into this block long retail shop now. Inside, it has a whole group, lots of collections of um, Western paraphernalia um, and photographs. And poor Corky, I, we think he fell in love there. <laughs> Sorry, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> well, this time we were seeing Badlands National Park. So another grouping of Badlands formed in a very similar way as the Northern Badlands, but the colors were a little bit different. The yellow in this park has to do with decaying vegetation, turning the limestone um, yellow. It also had some uh, very, these are uh, our classic, uh, plastic um, dikes um, that are formed. And you can see there's a lot of erosion here. They say that there's one inch of erosion each year. They anticipate that the Badlands will disappear in a million years. I'll never see it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it also is the site of um, numerous fossils, one of the largest fossil areas in the world um, where you can find ancient horses and rhinoceros. We didn't see any ancient fossils, nor did we see any animals. It was pretty hot out that day. And in the evening, we stayed on uh, some adjacent native, um, a native American reservation that had a campgrounds there. So again, you can see we were in the midst of the Badlands for our RV park for that night. Um, we continued on our way home. Um, here we are at the Missouri River again. And as we crossed it, there was a visitor center with this huge statue, 70 foot um, statue titled Dignity to Earth and Sky. Um, again, in tribute to Native Americans in the area. We also decided to take a stop in Mitchell, South Dakota at the Corn Palace. Notice it says world's only Corn Palace. Well, in the late 1800s, um, the Midwest had like 34 different Corn Palaces um, sort of to honor the soil, the production of the soil, not only to corn, but to other crops. This is the only remaining Corn Palace in the world. Well, again, on other trips, I had seen, you know, Corn Palace, Corn Palace, not quite as bad as wall drug signs, but, and I, you know, I couldn't imagine. And so I, I never stopped before, but it is a brick and mortar building. First of all, it has murals with all kinds of uh, each, every year there's new murals, but the fabric that they use is all out of corn and the area farmers grow different varieties so that they have all different colors. This is actually silks. You can see cobs, some have uh, corn, some don't. Um, it's just pretty crazy. And this is what the inside looks like. It's just a big arena. They're setting up this time for um, uh, uh, 
steer roping or steer riding, not roping, riding. And, um, but there's music, there's all kinds of venues, uh, conferences, all kinds of things there. And we were in Hayward, Minnesota for our last night, beautiful little campground, got in late, we're leaving fairly early, so didn't get to enjoy it as much as my brain thought we would when I, re when I <laughs> registered for it. <laughs> okay, we are home. Successfully, basically successfully, had a great time, good memories, a lot of lessons learned, and uh, the big one is we need a long um, handled uh, um, scrubber, <laughs> scrubber, so we could keep our uh, camper a little bit free of bugs. So we are done. We thank you for joining us on our adventure, and uh, we will be happy to answer questions if there are any. Thank you, um, Judy and Linda, for that presentation. That was really cool. You guys made me definitely want to go to Glacier National Park more than I already did. Um, at this time, we'll take questions. So one question we had was from Terry Hall. Um, they, asked, they said, tell me again what the cannonballs in the North Dakota Badlands really were. Oops. So um, the cannonball concretions um, are made of a mineral. In that case, it looked like um, a hematite, hematite that um, would have swirled around and more things would build up on the outside of it. That's how they believe it was actually made. So they were a little bit harder rock than um, the bentonite clay that they were um, found in or stuck in. Um, they didn't, it seems like they're not 100% sure how they're formed. Um, one question I actually had Oh, I actually had a couple of questions. So I know you guys said that you really wanted to try and stop places on your way there and back. Did you plan most of your stops or was that just you saw a sign for them and then you decided to go there? They were all planned. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. And even with the planning, some of our days were so long. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, when, once we were up in Glacier National Park, um, we were talking to other people and they kept talking about Banff, which is in Canada. It's only a two hour drive from where we were. I wanted to go there so badly, but we had everything so planned and all of our campgrounds already, you know, paid for, or at least registered for, um, that we, yeah, we didn't deviate pretty, you know, from what we did too much, what we had planned originally. Okay. Well, kudos to you guys on your meticulous planning. Like, yeah, I could, that definitely couldn't have, could not have been easy or or very quick. One other question I had, for, so on the Wild Goose Island, were people allowed to go on there or was it, it was off limits? It was just, it was really basically a little small island. And I, I don't know if you were kayaking or something, if you, I don't know what they do if you climbed on it, but it was just a feature. Okay. There was a, a pull off on the road and going to the Sun Road um, that a lot of people, they would stop and take pictures of it. It's sort of like, again, it's an iconic photograph of the area of the park and that would be in the background of the park and um yeah so we have pictures of that in the background <laughs> as well okay. so you, know, you can see it from the road you don't have to be on the boat tour to see it okay um we've had two more questions coming um Lillian Fleming asked did you rent your vehicle we rented the cars the RV is mine okay cars we did rent because yeah. we're not comfortable trailing something. It's been long enough already. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we didn't feel comfortable pulling a car behind us. So we just decided we would rent them along the way. Right. Um, the rental, but we really didn't have any trouble renting them. I mean, every, that was, we were still coming out of pandemic mode. So there were a lot of concerns that there wouldn't be cars available. We had no trouble renting them. We always got, the only place basically that you could rent them from were from airports. So it, you know, we had to plan our route and think about, you know, sometimes it was a little inconvenient to go to the airport to get it, but we needed the car in order to go places. Right. And then Lillian also asked, was there anything you regretted about your trip? Anything that we regretted? Regretted. Regretted. I, I don't, not really. It would have been nice, you know, part of getting the RV was so the dog could go with me or with us on a trip and not have to board it somewhere. Uh, so there were some walks we could have taken, but you can't go on the on the trails with a dog. Uh, so that, you know, but I guess I was okay looking at it. 
I wish I had thought a little bit more about going to Banff I, <laughs> um, and plan that in because I really wanted to go there once we were so close. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so, you know, thinking back about how we could have planned differently, but we also, we planned for three weeks and okay. we, yeah, we, and we didn't really want to um, go longer either. So, you know, you, you have to, you work in what you can along the, no. in the time frame. Act, no real regrets. No. no. No, we even got a lot. We're still friends. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> That's good to hear. And then Terry, Terry also said, so the cannonball sounds kind of a, a pearl. I took much the same trip several times in the 90s, and things have changed so much. Glaciers gone, tourist sites expanded, except not crazy horses. Still looks the same. Are you? Are they still working on it? They are still working on crazy horse. Actually, um, Stokowski's um, children and grandchildren are actually still sculpting. They're the sculptors. They were brought up in that tradition. They lived on the property. Zolkowski and his wife lived on the property as did his children. So it's kind of generational. They're still working on it, but it it's painstakingly slow because of the detail they're putting into it, much more detailed than what you see at Mount Rushmore. And, um, and also it can be tricky to work with granite because if you because you actually blast away parts of it. And if you blast too much, you're going to ruin what the sculpture is supposed to look like. So it's very, it's a very, very slow process. And then Leon asked, did three weeks seem like a long time for the trip or did it fly by? It flew. Yeah. Some of the days seem like they were like 48 <laughs> hours long <laughs> with, the, with the driving. It, it, yeah. Right. But no, it just flew. Well, yeah, that sounds like a really amazing trip. Again, that's definitely something I would like to do in my lifetime. Hopefully I can make it to Banff and I'll let you know how it is, Judy. Yeah. <laughs> that that, that oh, could no. be a whole nother trip. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You guys got to plan another three weeks. Yeah, I, you know, it was, um, it was fun to do the trip in an RV because um, first of all, you and your, we cooked most, our, just always, almost always cooked our own food. So we had actually pre-planned some of that. We brought some stuff, like we did pasta ahead of time and froze it. So we knew we'd be tired at the end of the day, right. but um, we grilled out some of the time. We had sandwiches, some, you know, so you have all your own food with you. Um, the beds were comfortable. Linda did a good job in buying her RV. <laughs> so the beds were comfortable and um, yeah. yeah. And then this will be the last question from Maria. She asked, how much time did you spend in Glacier compared to the back and forth of traveling through the trip? Third of the trip was in Glacier. Okay. So you spent so about a week in there? Or a week going out, a week in Glacier, and almost a week going back. Okay. We could have traveled longer. I mean, in short, if we didn't make those stops along the way, we could have traveled full days without stops and probably gotten there in a shorter time period. But just thinking about driving five, six hours a day without any stops, you know, we, you know, and there were so many things to see along the way. We just decided to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank so, yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was a great presentation. Um, as for the audience, the market calendar for next month's travelogue on April 18th at 1 p.m. Central Time, our presenter is going to be Carmen Masso, who will present on Barcelona and the surrounding area. Thanks again for joining us, and everyone have an, a fantastic day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Linda and Judy.